pray, church. All those who just need Jesus to come and overcome something in your life, will you just put your palms up, just open your hands up as a, as a sign of faith to receive this victory. Lord, we are singing about victory right now. We are singing about you overcoming everything that needs to be overcome. And, and we don't sing this, Lord, as something that necessarily comes in the future. We see this because we sing this because 2,000 years ago when you were on the cross, you said these words. You said, it is finished, which means you have overcome. Three days later, you rose from the grave and crucified death. So, Lord, we can sing this with confidence. And now, Lord, we receive these victories, whatever it may be, over marriages, over finances, over anxiety, over fears, over guilt, over shame. We receive your victory, Lord. We place our faith in you. God, we're about to open your word once again. We're about to open these pages of the book of Revelation, such a cryptic book. We're easily daunted by it, easily afraid by it, God, but... Ah, as we behold you through its pages, we just see nothing but good news. So I pray, Lord, that you may highlight that today in our study. And Lord, that Jesus may be lifted up. That's all, we, that's all we want, for Jesus to be lifted up. We pray, Lord, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant us to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. You may have a seat, church. Thank you, team, for leading us in worship. Thank you so much. Being out in the mission field, um, when I was out in, in the Marshall Islands, I, I had a little apartment with a window facing the ocean. It was, it was the most phenomenal, phenomenal view to be able to just wake up and see the ocean there. And one of the habits that we had, along with other missionaries, was go out snorkeling. We would go snorkeling out in the ocean, and, and we, we, we did that quite a bit, but there was this one point that was too scary for us to get close to. It was a drop. All we, we didn't know the technical term. We just called it the drop, and when you were underwater, when you were kind of snorkeling around, you could see the sand, and all of a sudden, you would just see this blackness, this darkness, and, and it was so, so terrifying for us to even start thinking of, of what was in there, what was out there so we would only see the drop from a distance we didn't know what kind of stuff we would find and just the thought of looking down and not seeing the bottom of the ocean just ugh, I don't know about you guys it just gives me the creeps for all you guys who scuba dive God bless you guys I'm never gonna do that it's just terrifying for me not to be able to see the bottom of the ocean and that drop that's what it symbolizes it symbolized terror for us we it was it, it symbolized it represented the unknown for us that drop Oftentimes, when we look at the book of Revelation, the first few chapters are like the sandy beaches in an ocean. We have Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. We see the Lamb of God, or we see the, the Son of Man walking through candlesticks, and we see some messages to churches. And then we get to chapter 4 and 5. We see the throne of God and, and the enthronement of the Son of God. Remember last week, we talked about John seeing... John weeping because he saw that there was this little scroll that couldn't be opened, and he was weeping because no one was worthy. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice saying, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy. He has conquered. So he turns, and he sees a lion. No, he sees a little lamb, right, that was slain. But the lamb is standing. So, so it, it's still solid ground for us believers, right? It's still safe. We see the lamb. We see the lamb the whole time, these first few chapters of the book. But then we get to a point in our journey in Revelation where, where there's a drop. And it gets scary after that point because you start seeing things that make us anxious, that creates fear and anxiety. We, see, we start seeing things that are unknown. And, and even though we've seen symbols already, not like these symbols, not like these words. There's cryptic language, but not like this language. So that's what we enter into today. We enter into some dark waters. But I can assure you, if you focus on Jesus, even in dark waters, you can leave this place with the greatest amount of hope you can ever imagine. I have this recurring dream 
and I, and I mean it, I really have this recurring dream at least once a month. It's a dream that I'm still in my third period class back in high school. It's call it uh, high school algebra, whatever. That I, that's how bad I did. I don't even remember the title of the... And I, I took that, I don't want to say how many times, um, but I have a dream. Literally, I have a dream that it's my senior year. By the way, the dream is simply a rehearsal of what actually happened because this actually happened. There I am, um, Algebra 2. There you go, Algebra 2. And, and I took it, I don't know how many times, and there I am, literally, on my senior, my senior year, my last, my last stretch, and I still don't know if I'm going to pass the class, and I still don't know if I'm going to graduate. And, and my, my fear was to, for, for the list of graduates to be displayed and for my name not to be on it. Literally, that was a fear of mine back my senior year. So here I am now at the ripe age of 34 years old with white hairs on my chin and two little girls and a beautiful bride. High school is long gone, but that feeling still haunts me. Am I in or am I out? And literally on a monthly basis, I wake up, Mr. Nichols, are you going to let me pass? There's this anxiety of mine that I'm not going to make it to graduation. There's this anxiety of mine that I'm not going to make it on the list. And for most readers of Revelation chapter 6 and 7, we experience a similar anxiety. Well, we see all these pictures and in the end we see a a, a group of people who make it, am I going to be on that list or not? And, and there's this anxiety and, and, and pl a plethora of Revelation seminars have been taught and many of us have left them shaking, wondering if I'm going to make it onto that list. I hope and pray that after our brief survey of chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Revelation that we may leave this place hopeful, Amen. When we have Jesus, we can be hopeful, we can be confident, we can just simply place our faith in him, because ultimately, he is an expert at saving people. He is an expert at saving people. So, I want to invite you to please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, and, and if you notice, over the last few weeks, we have already made it all the way to Revelation chapter 6. We've done Revelation chapter two, 1, 2, and 3 in the first sermon, chapter 4 and 5 last week. Now we find ourselves in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Like we said before, there is no way we can cover every single detail of these passages. We encourage you to please read for yourself. After this, the sermon is going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Facebook and on your app. You can look at these things and you can hash things out as well. Um, also, for those of you guys who have not made it to the 11 o'clock class, how many of us have been blessed by that? Have been, has it been helpful? Okay, I have been, I have been so blessed. I, am, I, I feel like I am, I am being reconverted to Jesus. I'm so excited and I'm so passionate about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm kind of going back to my first love. And I, am, I, I just hope and pray that, that, that you experience that as well. But we encourage you to please read along, hash out on your own time these passages, try to explore and dig deeper than what we can accomplish in the next, hopefully, 30 minutes or so. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Okay. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Revelation, chapter 6, verse 1. Verse one. Just to make sure you are with me. Will you let me know if you are there by saying a loud Amen. And it doesn't, you're cheating. You're looking on the screen. I'm saying you open your Bible, okay? Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads the following way. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. Now, remind, remember, last week we said that no one was worthy to open a scroll with how many seals? Seven seals. All of a sudden, we see, yes, there is one worthy, the line of the tribe of Judah, and then he turns, and it's the lamb who had been slain, but is still standing, implying he's resurrected, he's not defeated, he is worthy. So now we see the opening of these scrolls. He has a scroll, we see the opening of these seals. Okay, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, like thunder, come. And I looked and behold a white horse. What color? White horse. And its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. 
and he came out conquering and to conquer. Whenever you see a white horse in the book of Revelation, you see it a couple times, it represents Jesus. The white horse and its rider, the rider that is conquering, is representative of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so we see here, I, I, I read this commentary that, that framed this in such a beautiful way. We realize here that in, in the book of Revelation, we see these seven seals, which essentially, essentially are a survey of the history of humanity, more specific, the history of Christianity from the moment Jesus resurrected and went back to heaven all the way to the second coming of Christ. So it's a survey. The six seals are a survey of that. And it's interesting how it begins with a horse. A horse in scripture represents war. So it automatically it tells you this, you're, you're looking at a battlefield. But notice who was riding on that horse. I love the fact that your Jesus is the first one on the battlefield of life. You don't have to get into yourself. He goes before you. We just, we just sang, right? He goes before us. And here we have the rider of the white horse, Jesus himself, entering the scene. And he is conquering. He is victorious. Now, now we, we, we don't have time to, to break down. As a matter of fact, we may cover this in our 11 o'clock class in a few weeks. I, I'm still debating on that. We may not have a chance to... to, to you know, exposit all of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but we do see that it begins with a white horse, and then from that, from then on, it moves to three other horses. One of them is the color red, the other one is the color black, and then you have the color pale. And we see now, we can trace it through history how at first the church, when it, when it arose, when Jesus established the church, it was a pure church, it was a faithful church, it was a militant church that was just all about mission and about Jesus. But through the years, they experienced persecution and death, red horse. And if you continue to trace the history, they started compromising their faith. Black horse comes into the scene, and then eventually they experience spiritual death, and that's where the pale horse comes in. It's beautiful exposition. We don't have time. That's not our focus, the focus of our study here today. We see in Revelation um, chapter 6, these four horsemen. Then we see a fifth seal. And look at the sixth seal. All of it has to do with tribulation from that moment on. All of it has to do with the trials of the faithful. And watch in verse, verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full, the, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Verse 14, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is starting to sound like Revelation, isn't it? Before this, it sounded like the gospel. Right? It's just Jesus. Jesus. All of a sudden, we find tribulation here. This, now we're getting into Revelation. You see that drop? The darkness, right? The scary part? Watch. Uh, where are we? Uh, verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and uh, of the mountains, calling the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who was seated on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And then there is a question. Who's on the list? Who can stand? Like we just saw a very dismal, a very dark and, 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 and just difficult picture, right? We're talking about destruction and judgment. We're talking about punishment. We're talking about violence and, 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 and pain. We're seeing suffering. We're seeing all these things. And the question here is, yo, who is going to be able to stand this? Who's going to be, who's going to make it all the way to graduation? Who is going to be able to endure, to endure this time of tribulation? Who can stand? I want to submit to you, if you look carefully at the text, you have chapter 6, that covers uh, um, the seal, number one through number six, six seals. But how many seals did we say the scroll had? Seven seals. 
Well, it would be logical for, you, for, for, for seal number seven to be covered by chapter seven. Because if you notice, chapter six just ended. But, but, but the Bible does something beautiful here. Rather than going straight into chapters, into uh, seal number seven, there's an interlude. There's this little, there's this chapter that is inserted between the six seals and seal number seven, which begins in chapter eight. And the entirety, the entirety of chapter seven is actually trying to address this question. All of chapter seven is trying to respond to this question. Who can stand, who can remain standing in the midst of tribulation and those last day, very difficult events? Let's now move to chapter 7 for a moment and we're going we're gonna, to we're, we're gonna do a little bit of teaching if that's all right. So I ask you guys to please put on your thinking caps. We are supposed to honor our God also through our minds, Amen. So please just put on your thinking cap. If you take notes, please take notes. Please underline some stuff in your Bible. But most importantly, please look at Jesus in the text. Okay? So notice now verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 1 begins. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Notice what they're doing. They're holding back the four winds of earth. That no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal. With the what? With the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea. Saying, don't harm the earth. Or the sea or the trees. What's that next word? Until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Notice what's going on here. We just saw the emergence of tribulation. There's going to be a very, very hostile moment at the end. There's pain. There's suffering. There's tribulation. It looks kind of stormy. It looks dark. And the question is, who is going to... Who's going to be able to stand that? Who's going to be able to survive that? Now, all of a sudden, there is a voice saying, hey, before you unleash the four winds, meaning that tribulation, hold the winds, the four corners of the earth. This is obviously speaking um, poetically. Hold the conflict. Hold the tribulation until, until what? Until the servants of God are sealed. This, this indicates a couple things, family. This tells me that unless I am sealed, I cannot survive the final tribulation. Catch that? If, if God is saying, yo, 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 don't, don't unleash this thing until you seal that guy. That means that he realizes that unless I am sealed by God, I can't make it. I won't be able to stand. I won't make it on the list. I won't be victorious. I need to be sealed. Now, the sealing of God is in a way the protection of God. Because notice how the saints are not taken out of tribulation. They are sealed and protected through the tribulation. So in a way, as, as the earth is, is experiencing the most difficult era of its existence, you see God looking at his own. Hey, don't touch that guy. That one's mine. This one's mine. He has my name. Hey, that's one of my own. He is looking over those who have been sealed. Who belong to him. The Bible says God's servants. Now there's a passage in the book of Ezekiel. That I believe is an example of what would be to come. What is to come. Ezekiel chapter 9. We don't have to look. I'm just going to briefly describe to you what happens. Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel seeing a vision of of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem about to be destroyed. And it's going to be destroyed. And everyone is going to suffer. But before it's destroyed. There is a voice saying hey. He tells a messenger, a messenger of God comes and says, hey, 
we're going to put a mark on the forehead of all those people that are faithful to God. All those people that have not committed abominations, that have not worshipped other gods, we're going to put a mark over them so that when the punishment, when the destruction of Jerusalem comes and everyone starts being taken out, the people with the mark on their forehead will be left untouched. So sure enough, you see that, and the people who were marked by God did not receive the judgment, the destruction that happened to the rest of the city. So notice how thoughtful of your God. He knows tribulation is coming. He knows there's difficult moments ahead, and he is so invested in you making it, he holds the four winds until you receive his seal. So that you can be protected and survive. Now, now, what is the seal of God? Anton, what is the seal of God? I've been wrecking my brain. I've been talking to my dad. I've been talking to Anton. I've been talking to everybody. Like, what is the seal of God? We know in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, 14, uh, 3, 13, 14. You can show me on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Notice what, what, what Paul says is the seal of God. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were what? You, are you all awake? Come on, I want to hear nice and loud. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So, so what, what, according to Paul, what are you sealed with? With the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So if you look at this, it would make sense to say that the Holy Spirit is the seal of God, correct? But we already have that. You and I already have that. This is happening now. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit now. Notice how this is a different type of seal that you receive right before a tribulation happens. So this is when we start speculating. What is the seal of God? Is it an increase of the power of the Holy Spirit? Could it be the latter rain? That's a very Adventist uh, you know, language that we've used, simply speaking about an, a stronger outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Could that be the seal of God, the latter rain? Could it be that the seal of God is the perfected character of, of humanity when the Holy Spirit is in us and all of a sudden the character in us starts being perfected and we start reflecting Jesus like never before? Could that be the seal? Oftentimes we heard that the, the seal is the Sabbath, right? It's, it's Sabbath keeping. The seal is Sabbath keeping. And, and, and if you want to know a little more insight about that, please come to the 11 o'clock hour because we're going to get a little more into it in the next few weeks. But notice how the seal is not something you keep. The seal is something you receive. Okay? So, so, so what, is, what is the seal? All we know is that, 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 that we need it and that without it we won't survive and that we receive it. What is the seal? And, and, and I've, been, I've been asking, I've been reading, I've been praying. I mean, God, 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 show me what this seal is. I want the seal. I want the seal. I want the seal. I want to be on that list. I want to make it. I want the seal. Tell me, show me what it is. I, I feel like God released me. He relieved me yesterday afternoon. And this is, this is a new development. This, you don't have to believe this. You don't have to think this way. All, all, all I ask is that you think and that you, you, you wrestle with God. This is, this is what God did. This is where I am with regards to this topic. Please study on your own. As I was praying yesterday, just kind of reviewing, giving the final review for the sermon, asking God, God, what is this seal? I just sense God telling me, man, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. You're asking what it is. Revelation doesn't tell you what it is, but it does tell you who receives it. And it tells you what it does. Many, could it be, this, this is the impression I got, could it be that God, in his wisdom, he has guarded us? He has not fully disclosed this is the seal. Because you and I, being the idolatrous people we tend to be, we would be so obsessed with that when we ought to be obsessed with him. Could it be that rather than say, okay, it's this, uh, notice my attitude. What's a seal? What's a seal? What's a, my obsession was become, had become the seal when in reality, those who receive it are obsessed with Jesus. 
So could it be that God in his mercy, he is simply veiling our eyes. Just, just stick with me and you're going to get it. Just stick with me. Notice who get it. These are the people who are considered the servants of God. The word servants is the word doulos. These are servants that belong to God. Who belongs to God? Those who have been saved by the grace of God through the works of Jesus Christ. So could it be that it's less about what is it and more about who gets it, who receives it? And it's simply those who belong to Jesus. Does that make any sense? That's where I am. Let's continue reading here. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4 and 8. And here we're, we're going to get to some very, very confusing language here. Notice Revelation 7, 4 through 8 begins reading. And I heard the number of the sealed. What is it? 144. Oh, there's that number. Sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, for your, for your pleasure, I'm going to read all of them, okay? 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of? 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of? 12,000 from the tribe of? 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of? 12,000, this is like a tongue twister. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Ishakar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin. Fascinating. He is saying there's going to be 144,000 who receive this seal. Now, off the bat, if you are John, you are taken aback. You are blown away. You, you got to sit back and say, what? All 12 tribes are... You see, by, by the time this is written, this is, this, is, this is a picture of the kingdom, by the way. These 12 tribes represent the kingdom of Israel. But by the time this is written, only two of them are left. Ten of these tribes... Except for Benjamin and Judah, ten, the other ten have been destroyed. So what John is seeing here is the kingdom is going to be restored. God is going to redeem the brokenness of the kingdom, of the people of God. All those people that have fallen away through violence and persecution. All those people that have been that have been taken out of human history, it's going to be fully restored. This is a picture of a complete kingdom. The community has been restored by Jesus Christ. Just, just, just try, to, try to put yourself in, in John's place for a moment. Because here he is, a Jew, who perhaps for all his life had mourned the fact that the kingdom was no longer together. And he sees that in the end, it will be, and it will be because of Jesus. But there's something else interesting about this. If you look at the book of Numbers, you also see all of the kingdom displayed. But there are two tribes that are different in this picture. You see, in the, in, in the book of Numbers, you don't see the tribe of Levi, and you don't see the tribe of Joseph. In, in, in their place, you see the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim. So why is it that this list of 12 and the list of 12 in the book of Numbers are different? There are two tribes in the book of Numbers that don't make it to the book of Revelation. Why? Because these people were idolatrous and they had fallen away and gone after other gods. This is a kingdom that is complete and full of people who are faithful to the one and true God and are not given to idolatry. Now, this is where it gets interesting because 144,000, are they, come on, symbolic or are they? That's a big debate, right? Are these real 
144,000, are these symbolic? Are these literal or are these symbolic? So let's consider a couple options, though. If we're going to go for literal, let's say we're going to say it's 144,000 literal people. Is this literal, 144,000 out of all humanity ever to exist in? Let's, let's think about this, okay? If it's literal. Or, or, or is it literal? Is it 144,000 out of the 7 billion that are alive today? That would be 0.002% of the population. Revelation paints a picture of a victorious lamb who redeems a multitude. Does that sound like a big victory? 0.002%. So, so we, 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 have to, we have to be a, ask ourselves these difficult questions. Are these literal or are they symbolic? And, and let's say if it's literal. Let's say this is literal. Is the book, is the boat already full? Can I get in? And, and, and let's just say, I mean, if it's 144,000, even today... 0.002% of the population, I'm pretty sure I'm out of the boat. So you better believe I'm going to be taking some people. Out. It's like the Titanic scene all over again, yanking people off to get in. That hardly seems Christ-like, does it? Now, what does that do for evangelism? Wouldn't we want to keep people out to make sure we get in? Go save souls for Jesus. No, keep those dudes out. Let's make sure that my family gets in, right? So, so, so I mean, we have to be very, very, very careful and, and be, be, be critical in our thinking. Is this, is this literal? Is this symbolic? What is it trying to say? What is it trying to communicate here? And, and I think we, we, get, we get a hint if we just simply, hello, look at the text. If we just look at the text, and, and, and we're gonna, can we have a three-minute Bible study? Can we do that? <laughs> not like we're not having a Bible study now, right? Okay. Let, we're, we're not going to go on the screen right now. I want you to please keep that up on the screen. I want you to use your Bibles for a moment. Go to uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And I want to see this literary tool that John uses in Revelation chapter 1. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 1 in verse, verse 10. Revelation 1 verse 10. Are you there? Okay, Revelation 1 verse 10 says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I, what is that word? I heard behind me a loud, with, uh, uh, a loud voice with a trumpet saying, and then it has some red letters and tells you what the trumpet, what, what the voice said, correct? He says, I heard, and then it tells you what? Verse 12 says, then I, what does it say? I turned to see... The voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I, oh, we, we highlighted that the, the, uh, two weeks ago, remember? First, John hears, and then he turns, and then he sees. Revelation chapter 5, let's, let's move up to Revelation chapter 5 for a moment. We're going back to last week's uh, uh, scene in the throne room. Notice, notice the same pattern you see there in, in, in uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's go to verse 3. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, notice how he's hearing something. Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Now in verse 6, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I, what does it say? I saw. So in Revelation chapter 1, we see John hearing the voice of a trumpet. He turns and he sees the Son of Man. And now in Revelation chapter 5, he hears, oh, the line of the tribe of Judah. He turns and he sees the Lamb. Now go to Revelation chapter 7 for a moment. Notice, what, no, notice, notice here. And I heard, verse 4, the number of the sealed. What do you say? I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000. But look at verse 9. And then I, I looked. Do you see the same pattern? Do you see the same pattern? I mean, this is a literary tool that John is using 
to simply say what you hear will be explained by what you see. He heard the voice of a trumpet. He looks and he realized it was the son of God. Right? He hears the lion of the tribe of Judah. He turns. Oh, but that lion is actually a lamb. And then he hears 144,000, but he turns and he's like, this, this is a great multitude that how many people can number? Nobody can number. Do you see this? This is talking about the same exact group of people. Let us, let us be released from the fear that we will or may, that we may or may not make it into the list. This is not a, a literal list. This is, this is an inclusive picture. The, what this is trying to tell you is by, 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 by showcasing this perfect picture of a complete kingdom, 144,000 people, what it's trying to say is that the kingdom of God will be complete. It's going to be complete. What does that mean to you? It means that if you belong to God today, you will be God. You will belong to God then. You're not going to slip through the hands of God. You're not going to fall through the cracks. You're going to be part of that great multitude. So be released from the fear. Be released from the anxiety. This is not about you trying to make it onto a list. It's about you belonging to God. And the way you belong to God is through Jesus. So notice, notice, notice. You got, you got to see here because after this I looked and behold a great multitude. And no one could number it from every tribe, from, all, from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, all language. And they were all standing before the throne and before the Lamb. These people are standing. Now, now it's interesting. We, we got to understand. We got to differentiate between the two pictures, though, because there's, there's a significance between the 144,000 and the great multitude. There's a significance in the difference in the picture. 144,000, God is saying, don't start the tribulation until, until they are sealed. Where are they? On earth. They're on earth. Now, notice the great tribulation. Where are they? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You know what this is? John is seeing a before and after. He's seen God worried about sealing them. And he blinks. And all of a sudden, he sees them standing before the throne, victorious. The church militant, the church triumphant. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Doesn't that just open up the book of Revelation? Doesn't, just, that, doesn't that just open up redemption for all of us? Now, notice, I want you to pay, uh, pay, pay close attention here. And this is, this, is, this is something that just moves me. And I, and I, I hope and pray that, that I'm able to communicate what I see in this picture. They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And how are they dressed? They are clothed with white robes. And what do they have in their hands? They got palm branches. The, these guys are celebrating. They went from tribulation to a party. They're going from, from, from the, the greatest trial of their life to the greatest worship experience of their life. Verse 10, they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is, sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They are so confident and so aware of why they made it. It's not because of themselves. Their white robes are not fabricated by their own works. They are confident that salvation belongs to the man on that throne. They're confident that it is because of the Lamb of God that they're able to endure this and be victorious. So they take out those palm branches. Now, 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 don't miss the picture, though. I don't know, I don't know if you've ever gone through tribulation here on earth, but it sucks. It's painful. It's hurtful. It leaves you scarred. It leaves you wounded. Notice, they're before the throne. They have palm branches. And they're worshiping. They're crying out with a loud voice. But notice how verse 15 reads. 
Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him night and day in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more. If they experience hunger during the tribulation, no more because they're in the presence of God. They neither thirst anymore. If they experience thirst during the tribulation, not anymore. They're in the presence of God. The sun is not going to strike them. Not any scorching heat for the lamb in the midst of their throne. Don't miss this. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be there. What? How does a lamb become a shepherd family? The lamb becomes their shepherd and watch he will guide them to the springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes now I want you to please visualize this with me they're coming before the lamb they're coming before the throne they're waving palm branches but yes there are tears in their eyes because tribulation is painful because the earth hurts because pain, evil has, has a way of scarring the human heart. But they've been sealed. So they're before the Lamb. And the Lamb himself leans in and wipes away their tears. I want to be on that list. I want to be there. I want to be part of that group. Those people who are sealed and they go through that trial and then they end up getting hurt. But in the end, the Lamb of God becomes their shepherd and he wipes away the tears from their eyes. I'm going to start wrapping up here in a moment because we, we can't miss this next part. This is absolutely crucial. Notice verse, uh, chapter 7 verse 13 says the following. This is actually kind of, kind of comedic. This is kind of funny because it, sees, it says, then one of the elders, one of the who? One of the elders, right? This is a leader. One of the elders asked me, saying, so he's asking John, who are, who are these people clothed in white robes? So like the elder, the heavenly being is asking John, John, who are these people in white? So John says, Lord, uh, you know. Like, why are you asking me? Why are you? You're the one who knows. You're the elder here. So, so the elder responds and says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It doesn't say these are the ones that behave really well. These are the ones that kept all ten of my commandments. It doesn't say these are the ones who believe the right thing. These are the ones who recognize that their only hope for salvation was Jesus. That's it. These are those who washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Do you realize that nothing you do will get you there? simply trusting in what has already been done there's a quote i want to share with you guys that i think brings us together this robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one not one thread of human devising not one not your best behavior not your obedience not one thread of human devising no matter how righteous you may try to be on this earth none of that qualifies you to be there not one only the blood of jesus christ will get you there isn't that good news isn't that good news? so i have a challenge for you and this is found in revelation 14 revelation 14 we're going to start wrapping up there revelation 14 and let's let's look let's look at this language let's look at this language Revelation 14 here, verse 1 through 5. This is another scene of the same group. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. And it reads the following way. Then I looked, and behold, Mount Sion, on Mount Sion stood the Lamb, 
And with him were how many? Again, this is not a literal. This is a picture of the full kingdom. No one slipped through the cracks. No one fell through the cracks. Everyone who trusted in Jesus made it. They stood and had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard, verse 2, a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. And then here it goes. It is these, or your version may say, these are they. These are they who have not been defiled themselves by, another, by, by women. This is, in order to understand that, come to the 11 o'clock hour. We're going to get more into that. But here is a key. These are they who have followed the Lamb wherever He goes. Wherever He goes. Wherever He goes. The people who are over there on Mount Zion in front of the throne of God, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It doesn't say they follow the Lamb when it's convenient for them. It doesn't say they follow the Lamb where it's comfortable. It's saying they follow the Lamb wherever the Lamb goes. And family, the Lamb often ends up on a cross. The Lamb often ends up as a sacrifice. And if we're going to follow the lamb, we need to be willing to make some sacrifices in our lives as well. Because we follow the lamb wherever he goes. If he goes on a cross, there we go. If he goes into an altar, there we go. If, we go, if he goes out to the mission field, you better believe we got to be right behind him. And I have a feeling that some of us are stumped in our walk because we are only following the lamb wherever we like. Not wherever he goes. God is calling some of us to places, and we are simply not following him. The lamb is walking into spaces, and so many of us are just watching him go. You want to be a part of this picture, you got to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And that may mean a career change for you. That may mean you drop everything and go overseas and become a missionary. That may mean you're, you, it may mean that the lamb is leading you out of some stuff as well. That the lamb is not found in your habit. He's leading you out, and yet the lamb goes and you stay. It's wherever he goes. What is he leading you out of right now? Is he leading you out of your career onto something better where you're going to serve him in a way that he's purposed you to serve him wherever he goes? Could it be that the lamb is leading you out of a relationship that is just toxic and becoming an obstacle in your life wherever he goes? Those who make it are so obsessed with the lamb, they can't breathe without him. So they just walk. Oh, there he goes. Oh, there he goes. Oh, there he goes. It is my prayer. That we may smell and stink like lamb for the rest of our lives. Because we are in the presence of it all the time. Just following closely wherever he goes. And I just want to make an invitation today. You just want to recommit your life. And recommit to following Jesus wherever it is that Jesus is leading you to. He may be leading you into something new. Follow him there. He may be leading you into, out of something that he is not found in. Follow him out of there. Does anyone want to recommit? Will you stand with me? Will you stand? Because ultimately, if you're on the list or off the list, it really has nothing to do with you. It's about that lamb and what he did for you. No better way to place your trust in him. And just walking with him wherever he goes. Amen. Thank you, God. Because even as we reach the deep end and we look at the fall, these dark spaces that seem to be chaotic and painful, 
where tribulation is. Even when we look at the difficulties of life, we can see that you already have a plan to protect us and keep us safe. Lord, seal us today. Seal us today. Here we stand, a group of people who are your own, a group of people who are committed to serve you and live for you. In the midst of the tribulations of this earth, I pray, God, that you may just see the picture and spot us as one of your own and protect us and shield us, Lord that we may be a part of that great multitude that with palms on their hands and tears in their eyes stand before the Lamb. We love you, Jesus. We worship you now in your name.